Greetings, one and all. A little look at a lens, or I'm thinking I might call this series, if it becomes a series, I've got a few I hope to look at, uh, a lens from a previous lifetime. You maybe know the story. I was on uh, film, of course, and got a number of decades ago lenses on the Pentax um, system, including some from when people started selling them off because uh, Pentax didn't come out with the digital. It took a long time, and when they did, it was a crop frame, as most were to start with, of course, and then the full frame took forever. So there were people who simply jumped ship, sold the lot, and won the shop round the corner, and I think three LXs, a number of lenses, and I thought, all at, all at a very good price. Very good price, all of them. I said, what if I buy the lot? We'd do a deal. So they dropped it further. And the idea was, I knew I could sell them on eBay, the ones I didn't want, and get the money back straight away. Of course I didn't, and ended up paying the credit card bill over a number of years. Anyway, and then stopped using them for reasons just said before. Uh, film got too expensive. I, I got into other things. I was getting bad... Um, hit rates partly because I didn't realize my eyesight was deteriorating and the couldn't adjust the just didn't realize so you know everything was going anyway here we are a full frame body and some of these lenses that have been used in years and years and some of them are quite nice ones which you might be interested in I thought so I've got here SMC Pentax A 30, uh, 15 millimeter f 3.5 ultra wide angle I'll have a look close up from above because that's kind of what these are about to have a good look because it doesn't seem to be all that much on YouTube strangely but you can see it here on a K1 oops keep it close to me because it focuses on my eyes otherwise unless I do that perhaps I don't know if you can see it because I'm obscuring the camera from oh. so uh, as you can see something of a beast of a lens uh, yeah, let me just tell you what I've noticed. I'll just hold it here, because you may as well have something to look at other than just me. A little bit of history. 1972, you can find this online, don't know if it's true. Hmm. Pentax and Carl Zeiss produced prototypes of a 15mm 3.5 rectilinear. No curvature is the idea. Uh, with remarkably similar optical designs, so it seems that Pentax and Carl Zeiss were very similar designs. Carl Zeiss was purely spherical, so it says here, and the Pentrax, this seems to be quite well known, had one, at the beginning anyway, one aspherical element. The Pentrax production, when it came to actually doing it, was identical to the prototype, but the Carl Zeiss version wasn't the same as the prototype. It was spherical, but it had a floating element for close-up sharpness. So both were released, but Pentrax pretty soon cut, so so the story goes, the aspherical element because it was just too costly, difficult to produce. But it seems that 400 or so of the early ones have the aspherical element. This one certainly doesn't because it's an A series. It's a later model. This is what I've experienced, and I'll put the photos later. After, immediately after this, we'll do the close-ups, and then I'll put some photos and maybe chat a bit about it with the specific photos. They're not great photos. If you want great photos, there's plenty online. Mine are just the best I could do to give an example of what I've noticed, just what I've noticed using it a bit. I put here that sharpness seemed bad at first, but then seemed to improve. And I'll show you that. I think maybe I was starting to be more careful. I was a bit slapdash to start with. Maybe with the focusing, which I, you know, I assumed wouldn't make much difference. Obviously, makes some, but you know, it's not not much of a focus throw, as we'll see when we look at just that. The camera shake on such a wide angle lens shouldn't make much difference, really. So, but maybe I was a bit slapdash. I was looking at it; nothing seemed sharp, so it could be camera movement. Even though this has got stabilization, was it switched on? Did I check? I don't know. Anyway, we'll have a look. Um. Yeah. There's masses in frame. So this is the other thing. So, you know, I've got, I've got some with the church, you'll see. And I zoom in to look at the bricks, and I think, hmm, 
But then I look, and I think, well, I can actually see pixel. This is a 36 megapixel camera, so you've got to zoom in a fair old way. But of course you do because the picture is so large. Oh, it's got so much in it that you zoom into a brick and you're zooming into that. So there was a bit of that going, a bit of pixel, unintentional pixel people going on because whenever you go to check to see if something's sharp, you have to zoom so far in to get one thing unless you were photographing this right up close to it. Then, of course, the text and stuff you'd see, but pretty much any text, any bricks, anything like that, you have to zoom way in because they're so small in the huge um, coverage that it gives. So stuff like that as well. But it all seemed to get better, so I think my understanding got better. I thought here that a big sky can lead to washed out, low contrast look I've seen. So obviously, you know, there's going to be a massive sky. And often, actually, on some of them, there's quite a massive light foreground of pavement. You'll see the church ones. So there's a lot of light coming from there and a lot of light coming from there. And the subject's kind of there and it flares a bit with it. I've noticed that. It's possibly inevitable. I've, I've been looking at the um, review yesterday of the uh, Samyang. 14 millimeter 2.8 and some of my criticisms here seem to apply to that as well and that's a current modern lens so i think one has to understand the massive angle of view and how to use it and what to watch out for i put here my unit now this is later on i made these notes after using it for a bit i'd say it's acceptably sharp not bitingly sharp and i say again it's packed lots is packed into the frame so you're looking at individual bricks is like ridiculous and then I thought well it's designed in the 70s for film and for prints which would have been most people I mean it's a bit of a specialist then probably pros would have had it so they might make big prints from it but it was on film anyway so you know it's probably okay it's probably of, it, of its day uh, I noticed more contrast when not drenched with areas of sky the foreground some of them you'll see that seems to be sharper and brighter when it's not drenched with loads of sky and loads of foreground some vignetting and some mustache distortion Vignette vignetting apparently is easy to correct if you're doing architecture you'd probably need to for me it doesn't really show and the things i've been doing and the mustache dis distortion might be a bit tricky too if you've got any you'll see on one of the images if i put it in there that there's a straight line there's a wall or something in front of fence she's straight and it's got a moustache shape to it that might be a bit difficult to to correct possibly I can imagine it probably will be anyway um I put that it I find it useful and charming when used carefully and and I already had it so they're quite expensive second hand here's what I feel all ultra wides of this nature will need careful use but I get the feeling that modern ultra-wides will perform better. Also, I think the magic rendering of vintage 28mm, 35, 50, 85s, 135s, which I've got some, and they do have a certain something about them, which is very unprepared to put up with manual focus and the rest of it, because I like what they do. But I don't think that really applies so much to this, because uh, in ultra, or ultra-wides generally, because what do you want in an ultra-wide? I mean, in those others, maybe the 28, you might do a portrait, you might do this, that, and the other, and that rendering would be lovely. Um, but in an ultra-wide, I thought what you want is simply the least distortion, as far as I can see, the sharpest rendering, as far as I can see. You'd want it to be, because of the wide uh, coverage, you'd want it to be the most flare-resistant possible, as far as I can see. And contrasty, Basically, the, the magic of the vintage lenses, I think, becomes less applicable in an ultra wide. Because I can't see what are you going to use it for? Not that kind of stuff, possibly. Anyway, I'm happy with it, and it's fun. If I if I need, I don't really need. That's not the kind of thing I do really. But it's been interesting. I might start. It's been interesting exploring. Uh, if I didn't have it and I decided I did need a 15 millimeter. I don't think I'd look for this vintage Pentax one. There are newer one Pentax ones that might go for one of those, or maybe the Samyang, or maybe somebody else's, which I think, and one would hope, from the mid-70s, one would hope would be 
just generally better all round. And as I say, I don't think, depending on what I'm doing, that the slight vintage thing, which I do enjoy on the 85s and some of the others, and they're very sharp as well in contrast to you know, the rendering, I don't think it applies really quite so much to this. Anyway, I'll give you a good old look from uh, from the top and then show you just some of my photos, which actually it's growing on me. But then I haven't got anything else to compare it to. So, Okay, here we go then. The lens cap, as many people have mentioned, is a little bit of a liability. It's got some uh, felt in there, so there's a bit of a suction vacuum effect, but uh, frankly, it's just going to come off. And then you've got that huge front element. I noticed that the uh, review I was looking at the uh, Samyang, it had there and there little pinch things which... Uh, just clipped onto there. That would have been nice, but, you know, the Sam Young's 2021. This was a 1970-something. So let's remove it from the body. Have a good look. You can see there the um, filters. designed for, because there's no room for a filter on the front, uh, designed for black and white, I imagine. Well, got some ultraviolet and skylight there, but you've got the orange and the yellow. I'll show you the operation of that through the lens in a moment. Here's the uh, focus throw, which you can see. It's pretty short. And focusing again, because of everything so far away, unless you're right up against something, Say uh, I was in the church and you know, focusing on something in the church such a long way away. That's a little bit tricky. But then you'd hope there to be plenty of depth of field with a 15mm anyway. Uh, it's on A from because the camera will use A. Very nicely done. I think everything, sometimes either plastic, I think that's metal. Sometimes on the A series the aperture ring is plastic. I think that one's metal. How many aperture blades? One, five, the look of it. Yeah. But the, you're not, it's not really a bokeh beast, is it? Very snappy, the... Uh... Can't really see much from the front, of course, with the ap aperture. Hmm, bit of dust on there from just from today. Don't know if it'll focus that closely. Well, dust all over. Of course, we need to be very, very careful with that front element. And looking at it now, it looks in great condition. Just surface dust on the outside there. Oh, you can see the mess in my room, the bookcase. Oops. Well, I think that's probably enough, don't you? What more can I do? Astonishing, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, this is a later one, so I'm guessing 80s. But even so. Quite weighty. 
of course, one of the first things I always do is to... Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful. Because if you're not by... <laughs> <laughs> you're not watching what you're doing, sort of busy with the camera around your neck and you're just putting this on. You're going to uh, do that. So I tend to do that and watch what I'm doing while I'm doing it. There we go. Asahi Pentax 50mm. 3.5. Well, when I was editing, I realized I forgot to show you the um, the filters. I've got this case which fits it rather nicely. Let's see if I can do that now. I'm going to have to zoom in, or maybe I can just hold it up. It's going to be best from that side, so let me zoom in and hopefully it will behave. What I'm going to do now is show you the pictures and tell you what I noticed or what I thought. The first one here, actually what I've done to all the pictures is just use levels, automatic levels in Photoshop. No sharpening, nothing else. And actually looking at it there, that brick wall looked better than I imagined. And this one as well looks fine huh. when I first saw it. I think it's because I was zooming in. Here on this one, you can see that moustache shape of the railing at the bottom. That railing was straight. And again, you can see distortions at the corners there with the leaves. And this church one looks fine as well. Of course, you can imagine me trying to look at the bricks zooming in there. And this is already cropped that you're seeing. And again here, like anything that you zoom in for, for sharpness, or the clock at the top, I zoom into the clock, but look how small the clock is. So you're going to get pixels. And this one, so you can see that the wide foreground and the sky can cause flaring. There's a lot of um, such a wide angle. I thought it did very well here. These are handheld inside, so it must have been quite a, a long shutter speed with the um, anti-shake thing on the camera. And again there, very pleasing, actually. This one, some flaring going on. Most lenses probably would, but it's still some detail in the darkness around the edge. But, you know, it's a, it's a huge front element there. And this one, of course, you're going to get some reflections with the, the highlight that's uh, in, the, um, in the frame there. So, there we are. That's it. Um, having done the levels on the computer, just auto levels on a very old version of Photoshop Elements, so nothing fancy, no sharpening, nothing fancy at all. Uh, yeah, I think, I don't know what I've got the camera set on, I've got the camera set on flat or neutral, so it doesn't do any, it does minimal stuff in the camera. So I think that was part of the reason for the apparent lack of sharpness, even though even now I wouldn't say it's bitingly sharp is certainly sharp enough I'm very uh, and, and very nice actually I like those indoor ones I thought it handled them very well so there's that there's um the lack of any processing at all of any um contrast or level adjustment and as you could see as I was looking for sharpness and testing zooming into such a, a huge like that clock faces like that and the bricks are like of course, um, I realised it wasn't really so much a lack of sharpness as I was, I was down to a pixel level. So actually, for me, it's been very worthwhile and enjoyable and tantalising and rewarding to be lucky enough to have to be the custodian of that lens for a while. And I hope that uh, it's been of some use or enjoyment, perhaps, to, to some of you. And I'll see you next time.